Now, last week was essentially a preparation for what we're going to study today. Now, we ended the lesson by briefly discussing the history of the means by which the Bible that is in use today came about, including its progression from the beginning books of Moses called the Torah on up to what has been dubbed by believers in Yeshua as the New Testament or the Berit Hadashah. Now, the purpose of our preparation was to examine how best to approach Holy Scripture in the sense of pri prioritizing it, or if we should even do such a thing. We learned that early on, the Hebrew sages taught that it was necessary to carefully consider which of God's laws and principles might carry more weight than others, because inevitably there would be circumstances in everyday living when we'll have to choose one over the other because both sets of laws and principles couldn't be obeyed simultaneously. The example I have used on a few occasions is the well-known World War II story of Corey Ten Boom, who hid Jews destined for work camps and eventual extermination by the Nazis. But when asked if she knew the whereabouts of these missing Jews she was hiding, she said she did not. By all that is holy, she lied to her human government authorities. That's a sin. God never permits lying under any circumstances. Yet, if she had not lied, those Jews she was protecting would have been arrested and in time killed. She chose to save innocent human life, and she was right to do so. God holds the principle of preserving human life higher than the principle of always being truthful. Now, in the modern era, it has become the general mode of the Western Church and much of the Eastern Church to locate the first cut at prioritizing scriptures and laws at the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. In other words, we are to make the New Testament preeminent over the Old Testament in virtually every instance. But even more the general mode is to say the Old Testament has to be read in light of the New. That in essence we are to make the New Testament the foundation of the Old. The simplest solution for this is to simply declare the Old Testament is therefore irrelevant, if not abolished, and therefore for the believer our Bible is the New Testament and nothing more is needed. Now here is a quote that confronts this challenging subject of the creation and position of the New Testament, and it's addressed of all places in the Catholic Encyclopedia. The idea of a complete and clear-cut canon of the New Testament existing from the beginning, that is, from its apostolic times, has no foundation in history. The canon of the New Testament, like that of the Old, is the result of a development, of a process at once stimulated by disputes with doubters, both within and without the church, and retarded by certain obscurities and natural hesitations, and which did not reach its final term until the dogmatic definition of the Tridentine Council. As we found last week, the early church, early meaning the first 200 years or so after Christ's death, certainly did not agree with our modern concept of a New Testament that supersedes the old, or even rendering the old obsolete. In fact, the earliest Christian Bible, used for almost two centuries, was strictly what we today call the Old Testament, or in Hebrew, the Tanakh. And the first books to be added to create a so-called Christian Bible were not the letters of Paul or any of the four Gospels, but rather the books of the Apocrypha that had been so important to Judaism for several centuries. Only after that did even one book of what now appears as a separated biblical section that we call the New Testament become canonized and declared as Holy Scripture, and even then there was no church-wide agreed-to list of the specific books or letters that might form a Gentile Christian Bible until 367 A.D. at what the Catholic Church dubs it the Tridentine Council. Now further, 
By that time, the church had grown into two primary branches, the eastern branch the, and, the, and the western branch. And they had different religious centers, different religious governments and leaders, different religious practices and doctrines. One branch was based in Rome, the other in Byzantium, which is modern-day Istanbul. And they remain separated to this day, and they still don't agree on very much. Even the Bibles that the Eastern and Western churches use are constructed differently. Out of the Western church grew the Catholic and much, much later Protestant sub-branches. The Catholic church to this day still recognizes seven books of the Apocrypha as Holy Scripture. Protestants abolished those books from their Bibles at the decree of Martin Luther in the 1500s. The Eastern Church accepts anywhere from seven to all 15 of the apocryphal books as Holy Scripture, depending on which sub-branch of that we're talking about. Even the New Testament sections of the Bible used by the two branches are a bit different, as one accepts the book of Hebrews, for instance, and the other one does not. The focus of our discussion last week was to demonstrate that in addition to Christ's own words from Matthew 5, in no way was the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, abolished. And therefore it is self-evident that the New Testament must be taken in the light of the Old, its foundation. Just as in Deuteronomy 30, whereby the Torah was ceremony, ter ceremonial laid beside the Ark of the Covenant, with the most precious artifact in that box being the Ten Commandments, showing that the Torah was indeed connected to it, but it was also subservient to those ten words of God as given to Moses. So it is that the New Testament position is that it must be laid beside the Torah and the Old Testament. The New Testament is fully connected to the Torah and the Tanakh, but at the same time it is built upon its foundation. The foundation of the Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. The foundation of the New Testament is the Old, and I showed that indeed the connection and the pattern of biblical authority and hierarchy is even demonstrated in the person of Yeshua as he constantly stresses that he does everything in his Father's will, not his own, and that the Father was the supreme authority, even though the authority was given to him to wield on earth. Who can ever forget those dramatic moments in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that in only hours he would be tortured mercilessly and then crucified when Jesus asked the Father to take this cup from me, but may your will be done. What we're going to study today in Deuteronomy 32 was, upon its completion, laid beside the Ark of the Covenant symbolizing it was under the authority of its contents, mainly the Ten Commandments. Chapter 32 is called in English, the Song of Moses. In Hebrew, it is called Shirat Hazanu, which is the first two words of the Song of Moses, give ear. This song really is, is, is more of a psalm. It is prophetic, and it is a poem set to music. It is considered so important in the history of the Jewish people and to Judaism that it is set apart and it is recited at times um, when they're worshiping and celebrating. The idea of, of pulling a section of scripture out of its context and using it as a kind of standalone part of a religious liturgy is also done in Christianity as, for example, with the Lord's Prayer. Let's read this long song written by Moses only a few days before he died. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it starts on page 234. Hear, O heavens, as I speak. Listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. May my teaching fall like rain, may my, may my speech condense like dew, like light rain on blades of grass or showers on growing plants. 
For I will proclaim the name of Adonai. Come, declare the greatness of our God. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A trustworthy worthy God who does no wrong. He is righteous and straight. He's not corrupt. The defect is in his children, a crooked and perverted generation. You foolish people, so lacking in wisdom. Is this how you repay Adonai? He's your father who made you his. It is he who formed and prepared you. Remember how the old days were. Think of all the years through all the ages. Ask your father. He'll tell you. Your leaders, too, they'll inform you. When Elion gave each nation its heritage, when he divided the human race, he assigned the boundaries of peoples according to Israel's population. But Adonai's share was his own people. Yaakov, Jacob, was his allotted heritage. He found his people in desert country, in a howling, wasted wilderness. He protected him, cared for him, guarded him like the pupil in his eye. Like an eagle it stirs up her nest, hovers over her young, spreads out her wings and takes them and carries them as she flies. Adonai alone led his people. No alien god was with him. He made them ride on the heights of the earth. They ate the produce of the fields. He had them suck honey from the rocks and olive oil from the crags, curds from the cows, milk from the sheep with lamb fat, rams from Bashan, and goats with the finest wheat flour. And you drank sparkling wine from the blood of grapes. But Yasharun grew fat and kicked. He abandoned God as maker. He scorned the rock, his salvation. They roused him to jealousy with alien gods, provoked him with abominations. They sacrificed to demons, to non-gods, gods that they had never known, new gods that had come up lately, which your ancestors had not feared. You ignored the rock who fathered you. You forgot God who gave you birth. Adonai saw and was filled with scorn in his, at his sons and daughters' provocation, and he said, I will hide my face from them and see what, they, what will become of them, for they are a perverse generation, untrustworthy children. They arouse my jealousy with a non-God, provoke me with their vanities. I will arouse their jealousy with a non-people and provoke them with a vile nation. For my anger has been fired up. It burns to the depths of Sheol, devouring the earth and its crops, kindling the very roots of the hills. I will heap disasters on them, use, all my, use up all my arrows against them. Fatigued by hunger, they will be consumed by fever and bitter defeat. I will send them the fangs of wild beasts and the poison of reptiles crawling in the dust. Outside, the sword makes parents childless. Inside, there's panic as young men and girls alike are slain, sucklings and gray beards together. I considered putting an end to them, erasing their memory from the human race. But I feared the insolence of their enemy, feared that their foes would mistakenly think, we ourselves accomplished this, Ad and I had nothing to do with it. They are a nation without common sense, utterly lacking in discernment. If they were wise, they could figure it out and understand their destiny. After all, how can one chase a thousand to put, and two put ten thousand to rout unless their rock sells them to their enemies, unless Adonai hands them over? For our enemies have no rock like our rock. Even they can see that. Rather, their vine is from the vine of Sodom, from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are poisonous. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is snake poison, the cruel venom of of vipers. Isn't this hidden within me, sealed in my storehouses? Vengeance and payback are mine for the time when their foot slips, for the day of their calamity is coming soon, their doom is rushing upon them. Yes, Adonai will judge his people, taking pity on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone, that no one is left slave or free. Then they will ask, where are their gods, the rock in whom they trusted? who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let him get up and protect you. Let him protect you. See now that I, yes, I am he. There is no God beside me. I put to death and I make alive. I wound and I heal. No one saves anyone from my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear. 
As surely as I am alive forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and set my hand to judgment, I will render vengeance to my foes, repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, flesh from the wild-haired heads of the enemy. Sing out, you nations, about his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance to his adversaries and make atonement for the land of his people. Moses came and proclaimed all the words of this song in the hearing of the people and of Hosea the son of Nun. And when he had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words of my testimony against you today so that you can use them in charging your children to be careful to obey all the words of this Torah, for this is not a trivial matter for you. On the contrary, it's your life. Through it, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. That same day, Adonai said to Moses, Go up into the Avrim range to Mount Nebo, in the land of Moab across from Jericho, and look out over the land of Canaan, which I am giving the people of Israel as possession. On the mountain you are ascending, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. The reason for this is that both of you broke faith with me there among the people of Israel at the Miravat Kadesh Spring in the Sin Desert. You failed to demonstrate my holiness there among the people of Israel. So you will see the land from a distance, but you will not enter the land that I'm giving to the people of Israel. <clears throat> the tone of this song is interesting. Nowhere in it are the covenants of Mount Sinai or even of Abraham mentioned. Many Bible critics say that this song of Moses is patterned after the terms of a peace treaty that's commonly used between a vassal state and the king of an empire that's conquered them. But the usual treaty legal jargon and context is lacking here. And so with no mention of any covenant, this shoots holes in the suzerain treaty theory. Rather, the tone of Moses' song is more like that of a relationship between a father and his rebellious son. The premise is that Jehovah has created Israel, treat, uh, treated them with such great favor above all of his other creations. Israel is his precious firstborn. Thus, Israel has a moral obligation to respond with obedience reflecting their loyalty, and that born from gratitude. Verse 1 says, that the heavens and the earth are to be the witnesses to the facts of this case and to the charges being leveled against Israel by Jehovah. The term heavens is referring to the sky and to the objects that hang in it, not to God's spiritual dwelling place. As created things, the heavens and the earth are not asked to do anything but, but listen to the indictment. They have no role in carrying out punishment upon Israel. We find prophets from later times, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who invoke similar imagery of heavens and the earth as witnesses to Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Now, as I read this beautiful, powerful poem, I'm reminded of the many talks that I had, as most fathers have had, with my sons. When, at an early age, they had trouble choosing what was right. I would begin our talk in similar fashion as Moses says it in verse 2, and I paraphrase. I hope you can hear me, my son. And you can see that my purpose is only good for you. That what I offer is wisdom that is, is rain. And it can meet either with a welcoming soil that drinks it in and produces good things, or as a stony soil that resists the moisture and it just rolls off. It's lost. It's unwanted. This song is an expression of hope. 
Hope that Israel will listen to the words of Moses, heed those words before the inevitable happens. It is a hope that Israel will listen and remember all that the Lord has done for them, and thus not subject themselves to a wrath that his justice demands, but his mercy does not want to bring about. And in verse 3, Moses makes it clear that this song is in the name of God. It is not in Moses' name. It's not even his idea, even though later people will give it a title that bears Moses' name. What the song presents is not Moses' thoughts, but rather the will of God. To proclaim God's name is to proclaim God's attributes and character. The Hebrew word for name is shem, shem, and how I wish we could reclaim the real meaning of the word name in our society. For us, a name has no meaning beyond simple identification. One name is as good as another name. Some names today aren't even real world words at all. It's a group of letters that can be sounded out. A name means so little in Western culture that when we apply for credit or a title check on our home, our social security number is more proof of who we are than our name. But the real meaning of the word name goes beyond identification. It's meant to tell the word, world of our qualities, who we are as a person. One of my earliest childhood recollections is of my paternal grandmother saying to me, getting on my case, saying, you're Bradford, behave like it. She was a proud woman. She had worked very hard for our family in very difficult circumstances. She would gained a good reputation in the community. She wanted us individually to live up to that reputation. She wanted us to live up to our name. And Moses says that God's qualities and reputation are that he is a rock. His deeds are absolute perfection and that everything he does and ordains is just. He is faithful without fail. He is the truth. In Hebrew, the word for rock is tzur. Tzur. Immediately, most of you are thinking, I'm sure, that one of the wonderful names or attributes of Yeshua is our rock. Yes, the Lord being our rock was a Torah principle. It was not invented in the New Testament. Calling Yeshua our rock connected him to God the Father in every Jewish mind because the rock was a common epithet for Yehovah in that era. Referring to Jesus as the rock identified him as the Lord, but in the flesh, walking among us. And of course, that didn't set very well with the majority of the Jewish population. Tzur is an interesting word. It doesn't mean a rock like something you kick as you walk along a path. It doesn't even mean a boulder that might lie to the side of a path or jut out from a hillside. Rather, it more correctly means a cliff or a mountain. It's a high place. It's rooted firmly in the earth, but it reaches towards the heavens. A tzur is solid, immovable, and it majestically overlooks the plains and the valleys and the, the, the rivers of water that flow through them. Referring to the Lord as a tzur also fits well with the first name, attribute of God that's divulged to men in the Bible. The very first name, El Shaddai. Shaddai, as it turns out, is, the, is a language cognate of a Canadian, uh, Canadian, Acadian word. Canadian word. That's a good one. They do speak a different language up there. A language cognate of an Acadian word that means mountain. El Shaddai means God of the mountain. That is the name of God that Jacob first knew. So we see the close relationship between these two names for God, Tzur, 
a rocky mountain or cliff, and Shaddai, mountain. Now, referring to the Lord's sewer also fits well um, uh, with, with, our, with our Messiah, of course. And we have to envision him in the same way that we envision God as that rock. Now, I hope you understand that what these attributes of God listed in verse 4 actually are, they are the definition of divine love. From God's viewpoint, His love as directed towards us is defined as perfection, justice, faithfulness, and truth. Therefore, as we're the objects of His love, as we are His special creations, created in the image He expects us to demonstrate these attributes, right back to Him. We're supposed to do them in obedience. Perfection, justice, faithfulness, and truth. If we don't do this, this is not loving God. It is loving our own ways, our own desires. Loving God is not about having a warm feeling towards Him. Loving God is not our doing nice things that make, make us feel good about ourselves. Loving God is not showing up for a worship service and singing a couple of songs and placing a few dollars in the plate. When we mouth the words and tell one another that God is love, we need to visualize that what that means in God's economy is that God is perfection, justice, faithfulness, and truth. These are the qualities that when you take them together equals God's love towards us because these are the foundational qualities of God. Let me also mention that each of these four qualities is based on Jehovah's ordained systems of perfection, justice, faithfulness, and truth. It is His perfection, justice, faithfulness, and truth that's being talked about. We can't make it up as we go. We can't substitute our own modern definitions for the scriptural definitions, nor do the definitions change just because society evolves. If we think and we behave otherwise, this is called disobedience. And the result is what follows in verse 5. There Moses says that God's children have not demonstrated these qualities back towards God, so they're not worthy of Him. In other words, the problem doesn't lie with God, it lies with Israel. It is not the Lord who's corrupt, it's the nation of the Hebrews who is corrupt. Now the tenor of the poem starts to heat up. After the gentle fatherly urging to pay attention, to profit from this advice, the question is raised, is this how you repay God? For all that He is, all He's done for you? After all, it says, verse 6, He's your Father. He created you. It is difficult to express just what a shocking allegation has been leveled. Moses says, Israel must be dull and witless. Otherwise, it makes no sense that on the one hand, they can fully know and recognize that Jehovah has both created them as human beings and brought them into existence as a set-apart people, unique in all the world, but on the other hand, they treat the Lord as though He were not their Father Creator in every sense of the word. Beginning in verse 7, the history of God's blessings upon Israel is presented. These first few words are not asking Israel to think back several hundred hazy years to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just, just back one generation, one, to Egypt. Ask your fathers, Moses says, if you doubt me. Ask those who actually experienced God redeeming Israel from Pharaoh, leading them to freedom, presenting them with the covenant of Mount Sinai. In fact, says Moses, the foundation for that relatively recent event, the Exodus, goes back to antiquity, when the Most High assigned the nations their places, their territorial boundaries, on earth. 
And the elders, who are the storytellers, the tradition keepers, the leaders, are to be consulted on matters of the distant past. According to the book of Genesis, it was the great flood that the Lord divided, used to divide the single race that was mankind into many nations and scattered them over the face of the globe, the, which is, and then the aftermath of the Tower of Babel. This brings us to verse 8. An interesting place, I think we'll take a mini detour and we'll camp here for a few minutes. Here are some words that have been debated and massaged and changed over time and reconstructing them to the original sense exposes some fascinating results. Depending on your Bible version, you could have some radically different words for this verse as compared to other translations. And the variant will always have to do with the source of the particular translation your Bible is using. That is because the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Bible text from around the 10th century AD, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament Bible text from the 1st or 2nd century AD, and the Dead Sea Scrolls from about 100 BC, all treat verse 8 and another verse that comes later a little differently. Here's the crux of the matter. Verse 8 in most versions, including our complete Jewish Bible, says that God divided the human race and assigned them the boundaries of the nation according to the sons of Israel, or according to Israel's population, or something along that order. The verse implies that God created the number of nations, by definition, these are Gentile nations, as they were Israelites. And since tradition was, that 70 Israelites went down to Egypt with Jacob. 70 then is the number of nations that God created. Now obviously the account of Jehovah creating the nations by dividing the human populations into people groups in Genesis chapters 10 and 11 happened hundreds of years before Abraham, the first Hebrew, was ever born. So how can it be that God used the number of the sons of Israel to create the nations of the earth hundreds of years before Israel ever existed. It is this translation about the nations being created according to the number of Israelites that we find in the Masoretic Hebrew texts. But in the Septuagint and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find different explanations. In both of these translations, it says, Le Mishpar B'nai Elohim, Le Mishpar B'nai Elohim, which means, equal to the number of divine beings. Equal to the number of divine beings. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Septuagint, we have God allotting the nations and setting the boundaries of mankind according to the number of divine beings, not to the population of an Israel which didn't even exist. And while Jehovah assigned those nations to the divine beings, he also set, eventually, when it came into existence, Israel apart for himself. Some, some rabbis will say that a better translation is equal to the number of the sons of God. Most Jewish and Christian scholars currently acknowledge that at least during the era of Christ, this indeed was the reading of Deuteronomy 32.8 as found in the Torah. And since the original Septuagint was written even 200 years before that, the mention of the nations being divided according to the number of divine beings is almost certainly the original wording. So what does all this imply? I mean, if you're paying close attention to what I'm telling you, it's pretty difficult to get around the concept that the Bible tells us that there are other divine beings that rule over each nation of the world from a spiritual but real point of view. What divine beings are we talking about? Angels? Other gods? Demons? What? Now to complicate matters is that the word, the Hebrew word Elohim is both a legitimate biblical title used to denote the God of Israel, but it also equally legitimately means gods, little g gods, in the plural, many gods. And we also find this meaning used in the Bible and other contexts. 
Now, when we realize that the Masoretic Hebrew text was the preferred Hebrew Bible in use in the Middle Ages, it's fairly easy to understand the concern that the Jewish religious leaders would have had over the temptation to interpret benai Elohim as divine beings of Deuteronomy 32.8 as other gods. And to acknowledge even the possibility of other gods would lead to a serious theological problem within Judaism, especially since it was foundational scripture understanding that it was the worship of other gods that was always getting Israel into trouble, sent into exile. Yet in many places in scripture, in addition to Jehovah calling the other gods false gods, he also calls them non-gods, non-existent. Were these non-gods and false gods the same things as the sons of Elohim, the sons of God, also translated then divine beings? I hope you can see the repercussions here for all of this. This is a really thorny issue. Therefore, we can't just dodge the matter, which frankly has been pretty customary for about a thousand years. The question then is, are there actually other divine being, beings, labeled sometimes sons of God, that God has assigned to oversee the other nations on earth, except for Israel, whom he keeps for himself? And so what are these things? What are these beings? Well, we do indeed find this same phrase, B'nai Elohim, sons of God, in use in other places in the Hebrew Bible. In Job 1 and 2, we see the sons of God as a group who must time to time present themselves before the Lord to give an account of what they've been doing on earth, what they've been assigned to do. One of those B'nai Elohim, sons of God, mentioned in Job is given a name, Satan. It is explained in Job that it is this divine being's job to roam around the earth, see what kind of evil people are up to, and then go back and report it to God and try to convince God to make some kind of destructive action against them. Satan was the official accuser of humanity. Uh, but that's not all. We find that same phrase in Psalms 29 and 97. In Exodus 15, 11, we are often asked the rhetorical question, Who is like you, O Yehovah, among the sons of God, among the Benai Elohim? The book of Daniel also lends credence to the existence of these divine beings that God assigned over various nations. Turn your Bibles to Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter 10. Everybody go there. Book of Daniel, chapter 10. We are going to look at, to start with, uh, four, uh, verse 4 through 14. If you're a complete Jewish Bible, 1113 is the page, 1113. Starting at verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, I was on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, when I looked up, and there before me was a man, dressed in linen, wearing a belt made of fine Ufa's gold. His body was like beryl, his face looked like lightning, and his eyes like fiery torches. His arms and feet were the color of burnished bronze, and when he spoke, it sounded like the roar of a crowd. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see the vision. However, a great trembling fell over them, so that they rushed to hide themselves." Thus I was left alone. When I saw this great vision, there was no strength left in me. My face, normally pleasant looking, became disfigured. I had no strength. Now I heard this voice speaking, and when I heard him speaking, I fell down in a faint with my face to the ground. And then a hand touched me and raised me, tottering to my hands and knees. And he said to me, Daniel, you're a greatly loved man. Now pay attention to the words I'm saying to you and stand upright, for it is to you that I have been sent now. After he had said this to me, I stood up trembling, and then he said to me, Don't be afraid, Daniel, because since the first day that you determined to understand, to humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard. I have come because of what you said. The prince of the kingdom of Persia uh, prevented me from coming for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to assist me so that I was no longer needed there with the kings of Persia. So, I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the Ahrit HaYamim, the, the latter days. 
for there is still another vision which will relate to those days. So here we have what is described as a prince. We know it is a a spiritual prince from the context that comes to Daniel. But another spiritual prince that was in charge of Persia held him up. The only way the divine being that was talking to Daniel got free was when the chief prince named Michael, Michael, came and helped him out in his battle against the prince of Persia. Oh, but it goes further. Let's go back to Daniel 10. We'll start down verse 19. He said, you man so greatly loved, don't be afraid. Shalom to you and be strong. Yes, truly strong. His speaking to me strengthened me, and I said, My Lord, keep speaking because you've given me strength. And then he said, Do you know why I came to you? Although now I must return to fight the prince of Persia, and when I leave, the prince of Greece will come. Nevertheless, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. There is no one standing with me against them except Michael, your prince. Oh, boy. Here we have another divine being, one in charge over the nation of Greece, who is going to come when the, his, this other Bene Elohim leaves Daniel. And the reason Daniel's divine being is going to hurry and leave is because he has to go back and continue his fight with this divine being of Persia, which I guess is his current assignment. Further, the only help he's going to get, he says, will come from the this one chief, B'nai Elohim, named Michael. I mean, there's little escaping the fact, the Bible says pretty straightforwardly, that there are other divine beings, sons of God, who, some who are in opposition, some who are on God's team, and that God has paired these B'nai Elohim up with each of the nations that he has created and he has established on earth. I want to be blunt. The reason you see most of this covered over and avoided, especially this section about the B'nai Elohim in Deuteronomy, is because Jewish and Gentile theologians aren't quite sure what to do with this. There is genuine fear that the masses of the followers of the God of Israel will misunderstand, and they, they will see these sons of God as either self-created or completely anonymous being, uh, autonomous beings, or as actual real gods that are usually referred to in Scripture as false gods. Further, taken to an extreme, it could bring a false credibility to the notion that every nation had its own god or set of gods. And we've talked about this quite a bit. And I've told you it, how it was thought among the ancients, that each nation had its own unique pantheon of gods and that the gods were territorial, and that their power ended at the borders of that nation. The god of Canaan had power there, for instance, but generally nowhere else. Here's what we can take from all this, I think with some confidence. There are other divine beings, and they have some kind of spiritual power and control over the nations of the earth. They are are not self-created beings. They are Jehovah-created and Jehovah-controlled. They serve some kind of purpose in his plan of the history of redemption. Satan, the great adversary, is one of those divine beings. They were paired with the various nations created by God as a result of the Tower of Babel and, to a degree, the Flood. And there is no reason to think that they are not still exercising that power today. But all of it is at the will of God. They are not actually gods, but you can bet that at times they've been worshipped as gods, all throughout history. Now, why do I bring this up? Because if these sons of God, B'nai Elohim, these princes, as Daniel calls them, do indeed exist, and they are assigned to the nations of this planet as believers, I think we better know about it. I mean, maybe it'll help us to get a better handle on just what's going on in this world of ours that inexplicably seems to be just tumbling out of control. I mean, What common sense seems, where common sense seems to have just vanished in our leadership, and a small part of the world is moving closer to God and to Israel, but the vast bulk is moving away from Him and from His people. 
I told you a few weeks ago that we would encounter some major mysteries in these last few chapters of Deuteronomy. Mysteries that have led Bible scholars astray, but also held many spellbound for centuries. Mysteries that have caused many translators to simply gloss over sections of the Torah and other parts of God's Word where these mysteries appear, and in their place insert things that were never there because they better fit with long-held man-made speculation and doctrines because those don't bother us very much. Let's move on. But let me say one more time so I'm not misinterpreted. This is not speaking of other gods. You with me? Angels are divine beings. That doesn't bother us. But there's something else, too, besides the angels that are divine beings. They're not gods, but they are given power over nations. <clears throat> well, now that we understand that God gave authority over the other nations of the earth to subordinate spirit, to subordinate spiritual beings, perhaps we can better understand the great privilege he bestowed on Israel by saving that one for himself. See, this decision automatically makes Israel different. This distinguishes Israel apart from all the others. And to think that some anti-Jewish, anti-Scripture church leaders later declared that God has reversed his decision and he's made Gentile, the Gentile church for the, reverse, for the purpose of replacing Israel just boggles the mind. So when we see the words that Israel was the Lord's share or portion, we now know the answer to the question, his share of what? His share of the nations, the rest of whom were given over to, to divine beings, but under the authority of God. Here, incidentally, we see Moses call Israel Jacob. And remember that the patriarch Jacob had his name changed by God to Israel, and so Jacob's sons, Israel's sons, formed the nation named after their father, Israel. All throughout the Bible, we're going to see the names Jacob and Israel alternate. Rabbi Baruch the other night brought up a great example in the New Testament in the book of Acts. When he said, there's this statement that's thrown everybody. Not all of Israel is Israel. You remember that? All right. That's because we're to take the first Israel as meaning Jacob. Not all from Jacob is Israel. Israel. All right? And then when we understand that Israel is a, is a, uh, a, a, a heavenly ideal of people set apart for themselves, then we see what he's saying. So we have to watch out for that. At times it's just meaning the patriarch Jacob. At times it's referring to the nation of Israel. At other times it's referring to what Israel is in God's eyes. And verse 10 reminds Israel that God found them out in the wilderness or more literally desert regions, and it was in the barrenness of the Sinai and Arabian peninsulas that the Israelites wandered. And it was there that they received the covenant with God that made them his people and he their God. Now the usual translation that God found Israel in the desert, though, misses the mark. The verb more means to provide for or to maintain. The idea is God sustained Israel out in the desert while he watched over them carefully ensuring their security, their survival. This is consistent with the earlier statements of God being Israel's father. And then the next several verses with the various illustrations, and, there are, and then there are metaphors used to characterize this, this loving care that Jehovah bestowed upon his people. Now in the last words of verse 10, it says that the Lord guarded over Israel as though it was the pupil of his eye. Now, while the translation about the pupil of his eye isn't wrong, it doesn't carry with it the depth that it could if it were translated literally. I want you to do something for me. I'm serious about this. Turn next to the person next, next to you, and I want you to look very carefully into the pupil of that person's eye. Look very carefully and tell me what you see. I'm really serious. It's very interesting. Look into that little round section of the eye. Now, if you look very carefully, you know what you see? An image of yourself. 
reflecting back at you. That's what you see. It's as though you're looking into a curved mirror. It's very interesting. What this verse literally says is that God protected Israel like the little man in his eye. That's what it says literally. The little man is what you saw in your friend's eye. Notice how close you had to get to that person to see that little man who is you in his or her eye. Isn't that a great picture? The statement to end verse 10 is so intimate. Have you ever sat and just stared adoringly at your spouse or your young child or your grandchild, particularly when they weren't aware of it? Just reveling in their image and thinking how you'd do anything, you'd give anything to protect them. You see, this verse is not about God protecting the sensitive pupil of his eye. It's about God protecting the image of you that's in his eye. You. In this case, he's speaking of Israel. What a great scene that is. In verse 11 is another vivid metaphor that's used to describe how God cares for his people. And the metaphor is of an eagle training its young to fly. It speaks of the eagle bearing the young on his back, taking them to high places along with him. And this didn't impact me until I ran across accidentally, yeah, accidentally, something that helped me to understand how it is that eagles actually train their eaglets. I never realized before that what is described here in Deuteronomy 32.11 is literal. It's very real in nature. Perhaps the godfather of North American ornithology, birdwatching, is uh, Arthur Cleveland Bent. A.C. Bent in the early 1900s wrote about this observation of an eagle teaching its young to fly. Now, I'd ask you to become just, just quiet for a moment. Close your eyes if you're comfortable with doing it. See if you can visualize what I'm about to quote to you from, from his writing. It's beautiful. Speaking of eagles, the mother eagle started from the nest in the crags and roughly handling the youngster, she allowed him to drop. I should say about 90 feet. Then she would swoop down under him, wings spread, and he'd alight on her back. She would then soar to the top of the range with him and repeat the process. Once, perhaps, she waited 15 minutes between flights. I should say the farthest she let him fall was about 150 feet. My father and I watched him spellbound do this for over an hour. Whoa, what an image. The Lord takes Israel, teaches her in the same manner, he says, that an eagle teaches his young to fly on their own. But the only way for Israel to learn is to take her to the high place and then release her. Early on, whether it's from lack of self-confidence or lack of trust in God, or not yet having learned the intricacies of winged flight, Israel would simply plummet straight towards the earth in a death spiral. But suddenly the Lord would swoop down and in a nick of time catch her on his own back. Back up to the summit goes Israel, only to have the process repeated. Sometimes Israel would be given time to rest and catch its breath, but when the Lord decided it was time, flight training again, What great patience the Lord exhibits. It doesn't matter how many times it's needed. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Israel may feel terrified and momentarily alone and completely out of control. But the Lord is there, 
always the catcher on his own back as an eagle catches their young. And the purpose of all of it is to teach Israel the ways of the Lord. To teach Israel how to soar one day above all the high places just like its parent does. Oh, I ask God to make it so in all of our lives. Please rise. <laughs>